This is IB section 8.1, and this will be the last video for our proteins unit. And in this video, we're going to talk about metabolism, and more specifically, metabolic pathways. And a metabolic pathway can be viewed as a large sequence, not always maybe large, but a number of steps um, that occur in order for something to happen. And these metabolic reactions are linked so that sometimes the products of one reaction help to drive or you can kind of think of it as the on switch for the next reaction. And so in this video we're going to look at metabolic pathways and, and how these, these work. And to really break it down and to give a simple definition for it, um, they're, they're uh, interactions that occur that help to produce some end product or end result. An example of a metabolic pathway would be like the production of glucose through um, photosynthesis, the light independent and light dependent cycles, or the production of ATP um, uh, through cellular respiration. That, those would both be examples of metabolic pathways that we'll talk about a little bit later on in the year. Um, chemical changes in molecules don't just happen in one, in one jump. It takes multiple uh, steps in order for um, things to occur. It's a sequence of small steps um, or a chain of reactions that's necessary in order to form some end product. And sometimes those, those chains can be viewed as a cycle, or they're actual uh, a continual cycle. Um, and sometimes they're also a, so, uh, also a chain. And so here's this image here. It's kind of showing us um, the, the linking of different metabolic reactions. And uh, actually, in my classroom, I have some posters where we can see lots of different types of metabolic reactions and the products that they produce and how they're linked with one another. And all of these metabolic pathways, these reactions, are made possible by enzymes. We've talked about enzymes already um, in previous videos, but enzymes um, help to lower the activation energy of the chemical reactions that they catalyze. And so this graph, again, does a nice job of showing how the enzyme, which is uh, the blue here line, is reducing the amount of energy that's necessary in order for that reaction to occur. And so this helps to speed up the progress of a reaction. Um, the activation energy is necessary to, to begin a reaction to break or weaken the bonds between different molecules. And so then the enzyme is actually catalyzing a reaction in which the substrate binds to the active site and is altered to reach some sort of transition site or converted into some sort of product. And the binding then lowers the overall energy level and reduces the activation energy, um, the binding of that enzyme. And so enzymes, enzymes are reducing the activation energy that's necessary, helping to speed up reactions. Well, sometimes different things can inhibit or block or hinder or even slow down the rates of reaction. And one of those uh, mechanisms is called competitive inhibition. And you've probably heard that, that term competitiveness uh, before. It's, it's in this case, um, something competing for that enzyme. And so in this case, here's our, our normal reaction where the gray uh, Pac-Man-like circle is the enzyme. Here's our substrate. Here's the active site where that substrate is going to bind. The substrate binds, and then the product is produced. Well, in competitive inhibition, some other molecule is competing for that active site so that the enzyme is not able to bind with the uh, substrate. And so in this situation, here's our inhibitor, this teal color molecule. And it binds with the enzyme so that the actual substrate is not able to bind with the enzyme. And so in this case, then, the product right here in the normal reaction, um, the product is, is not able to be formed. And a, a real example of this is um, uh, malonate is structurally similar uh, to the substrate succinate. And uh, succinate would traditionally bind to dehydrogenase uh, enzyme during the Krebs cycle. Krebs cycle is part of cellular respiration that we'll learn and talk about. And so malonate will compete with succinate uh, for the active site. And so if, if we were to apply this image here to that example, uh, the enzyme, the gray portion here, would be the dehydrogenase, that's the actual enzyme, and malonate would be the inhibitor. And so malonate comes along and it binds to this enzyme, and succinate, which is the traditional substrate, is not then able to buy, bind with the dehydrogenase, and so then the product uh, cannot be formed. There's another type of inhibition, and that's called non-competitive inhibition. So in this example, competitive inhibition, uh, there's a product that's competing for the, the binding of the active site. 
And non-competitive inhibition is still a form of inhibition that's blocking that metabolic reaction. But in this case, it's a little bit different. Here's our same normal traditional reaction. In non-competitive inhibition, what is occurring is that the inhibitor is binding not to the active site, but in some, to, to a location on the enzyme, something called an allosteric site. And so in the enzyme, you can see that right here. Here's the allosteric site. The inhibitor comes along and it binds to the allosteric site. And what that does is it changes the shape of the active site. And so you can see that the active site has been changed here, and thus no longer the substrate is able to bind with that enzyme, and the product can't be produced. Um, here's another image that shows that in a little bit more detail, where the allosteric site, uh, the, the binding of the inhibitor at the allosteric site, um, in this case here, changes the shape of the active site, and so that, that substrate's not able to bind with it. And an example of this is um, uh, the production of ATP. And when too much ATP is produced, it causes it to bind to the enzyme phosphofructokinase. There's an E missing from the end of that, but it should be phosphofructokinase. And so what this does is it causes the enzyme to change shape, and it lowers uh, the rate of reaction. So then less, it's producing less ATP because there's always already abundance of ATP, and so more ATP doesn't need to be to be produced. And so this is an example of end, uh, excuse me, non-competitive inhibition, where the the um, the molecule, the inhibitor in this case, is not binding with the active site, but is binding with the allosteric site. And so if we go back to what we talked about earlier in the video with metabolic pathways generally being multiple steps or multiple sequences of uh, reactions that occur to produce some final results. Um, another form of inhibition is called end product inhibition. And this is really what it exactly it sounds like, is that the end product is acting as the inhibitor, oftentimes through non-competitive inhibition. Um, and so in a situation where there's a metabolic pathway, so here uh, we, we see a substrate, and the, the pathway op operates with that substrate binding to the enzyme. And enzyme number one then produces uh, intermediate product A. That product binds with enzyme two. Intermediate B product then binds with enzyme uh, three. And so then you get an end product. That end product then does whatever it's supposed to. Well, an end product inhibition, if there's too much of that product present, um, in this case, our little circle, red dot circle here, that end product inhibition can act as non-competitive inhibitors. And so this product, if there's an abundance of it, like going back to the ATP and the phosphofructokinase, if there's an abundance of it, it can act as a non-competitive inhibitor for the first enzyme in that reaction. And so this end product goes back, and because there's so much of it, it's going to bind to the allosteric site of that first enzyme, thus changing the shape of the active site for that first enzyme, and then the substrate for that first enzyme can't connect, and so it can't produce a product, and that essentially turns off the whole reaction. So it's kind of like an off switch. Um, and so the active site is the location of, of the product binding. Uh, it's, not, it's not the active site. Um, an example of this uh, includes five different reactions where the amino acid theranine is converted to isoleucine. And so an increase in isoleucine binds to the allosteric site of the first enzyme uh, in, in the chain, and it acts as a non-competitive inhibitor that essentially helps to, to stop the conversion of, of theranine to isoleucine. Another example of that would be, uh, as we talked about, the abundance of ATP, um, causing it to bind with the enzyme phosphofructokinase, uh, and also shutting down the production of ATP. So an end product inhibition, the product of that metabolic pathway acts most often as a non-competitive inhibitor that shuts down that, that metabolic pathway in, that rea in those reactions. So if we were to graph these or to show these um, on a graph, uh, these different types of inhibitors, we can see how they affect um, the, the rate of reaction. So on the y-axis here, we're looking at the initial rate of the reaction. Um, this is the effects of an inhibition on enzyme kinetics. And on the x-axis, we have substrate concentration. So this is the increase in substrate. As we move away from the point of zero, increase in substrate, increase in rate of reaction. And so we can see here in our green, 
Um, this is an uninhibited, so there's no competition, no competitive inhibition, no non-competitive inhibition, no end product. Um, and so that reaction is going to increase up into a point as the substrate concentration increases. That's something that we should know in looking at our overall um, uh, effects of, of different factors, um, substrate concentration being one of those on enzymes. Now when you add in different types of inhibitors, it's going to change the overall output and the rate of output. And so a non-competitive inhibitor is going to have a, a slight increase as the substrate concentration increases, but then it's going to uh, level off very, very quickly. Um, a competitive inhibitor, uh, not quite as fast. So the non-competitive inhibitor is um, much more effective in decreasing the rate of the reaction than a competitive inhibitor, um, is, is what this graph is showing here. One last thing that I wanted to discuss, this is not necessarily in the notes, uh, in the standards for, for this section, but I thought it was important to include, um, and that's the idea of an induced fit model, um, where most often the binding of a substrate to an active site on an enzyme um, is, is very specific. So only a specific substrate can bind to a specific enzyme, and this is due to the actual 3D conformational shape, um, the polarity, the, the charges, and whatnot. And so it's a very specific enzyme and a specific substrate. Um, in some situations, the enzyme can slightly bend or be changed slightly so that the substrate can actually bind with it. And you could think of this as if you were to sit in a folding lawn chair, and that chair is not quite all the way open. But as you sit into that chair, it opens so that you're actually able to sit into it. Well, that's the kind of the same idea as the substrate binds with the enzyme. It molds that active site to fit the substrate and then thus is able to produce a product. And we can see that in the image here. It's not a complete exact fit, but it's very close. The substrate is able to bind with it and it does still produce the product. So that is our wrap up for uh, our proteins unit and for our metabolic reactions video. Um, make sure you're able to distinguish between competitive and non-competitive inhibition and know the difference between an active site, allosteric site, and how those inhibitors can affect those two different uh, can affect those different pathways.